Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast Team Preview Edition. I'm your host, Ian Hardich, and joining me as always, the one, the only PFF's finest, Dwayne The Rock McFarlane. Dwayne, we're talking Chicago Bears today. What's up, man? Yeah, man. Uh, it's summertime. We are talking football. And this is what we get to wake up and do every day. Like, yeah, things are good. <laughs> summertime, <laughs> things are good. summertime, and the living's easy. As a wise man, you know, was forced to say after their original lyrics apparently weren't mainstream <laughs> enough. But with the Chicago Bears, as always, going to go through some of the front office turnover, roster turnover, then go through quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end, hitting all the fancy relevant players along the way. Thirty first one of these guys will be back tomorrow with the Detroit Lions, and then we're done with the team previews. Absolute whirlwind of a last, you know, eight weeks here, but really do think we've accomplished a lot. Got our, you know, bases firmly set for all these players, and then uh, soon. As next week starts, going to be much more diving into the strategy side of things. Not that we've ignored that already, but you guys know how it goes. So with all that said, let's take a look at the Chicago Bears. Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace era is over. Had that promising 12-4 and record in 2018. Back-to-back 8-8s, and eights, and then last year's 6-11 and 11, third 6 and 11 third place finish throwing the 0 2 playoff record and it was time for a change that's where we now got head coach Matt Eberflus and offensive coordinator Luke Getze former since the last four years as defensive coordinator for the Colts latter served as the passing game coordinator and quarterbacks coach for you know someone named Aaron Rodgers Dwayne over there in Green Bay since 2019 so as has been the case with a lot of these McVay LaFleur Shanahan disciples it's tough to kind of discern exactly how much they had to do with the offense and how much was just the head coach who is actually the one calling the plays. Either way, looking at what Getsy was doing with Green Bay, as we just recently talked about in our Green Bay Packers preview, a bit more of a run balanced offense than I think maybe people realize. So 2019, they were 11th in pass play rate in non-garbage time situations. They were 23rd in 2020, and they were 16th in 2021. Slow pace the entire time, 31st in situation neutral pace, courtesy of Football Outsiders in 2021, 32nd in 2020. So again, Dwayne, it'd be It'd be silly for Getsy not to do something a little bit different, you know, and just really optimize the talent he has at hand. But looking at what he went through in Green Bay, looking at the Bears kind of overall lack of pass catchers and the fact that we got Eberflus, a defensive minded head coach, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Bears are a top 10 rushing offense. I think that's going to be their plan. I think that's what they will want to do. Um, and, you know, I mean, you mentioned it just now, but when you have, if if they implement Justin Fields the way that we want them to, <laughs> which would be really, you know, unleashing his uh, rushing upside, which is Matt Nagy, just Matt Nagy, man. Wow. You know, he's got <laughs> that play calling sheet that says UBU on it or whatever. Like he should scratch that shit out. Like it's just uh, like he should be someone else because, oh. like, uh, hey, man, like it was terrible. Like his, the play designs for Fields, it's like we had him running Andy Dalton's offense. You know, it's like, come on, dude. Like, again, like it's an NFL coach. I know it, obviously. Like these guys are super smart. You know how much stuff these guys manage and how how good they have to be with their time, you know, and then you have to be able to motivate people. Like it's a very complex job. So, you know, I say that tongue in cheek. But at the same time, we just didn't see him really give Justin Fields an opportunity at all to get more involved with the design rushing plays like we would really hope that we would see. And we also just didn't see, you know, and some of this can come down to fields, you know, I don't know if they were coaching it or not, but just not quite scrambling as much as, you know, what we would want to see from a quarterback like that, especially whenever you've got limited, you know, passing options. Um, I do think to your point, they're going to want to be as run heavy as they can, um, you know, and, and having Justin Fields involved with that obviously would tilt things further that way. The question is, how good can the Bears be? You know, how often can they actually play in, in close or leading game scripts? You know, even if they want to run the ball, you know, even when they're trailing more than the NFL average, still, if you trail all the time, like it's going to push your, it's going to push your pass run splits, you know, the other way. But I think if they, in a perfect scenario, Ian, they would probably like to be like one of the more aggressive, like maybe 55, 45 type of a deal, um, dropbacks versus, you know, rushing plays. Um, the question is just how good can they be, right? They're only, I think they're projected for six and a half wins right now. I, I just um, pulled it up there at six and a half with the Lions and Jaguars, only yeah. teams with lower win totals, Panthers, Seahawks, Jets, Falcons, and Texans. Yeah, so, uh, you know, they're going to have a plan. It's a matter of how, how much can they stick with it when they get punched in the face. You know, some coaches do stick with it more than others. Like we, Mike Vrabel will take 20 punches to the face and he does not care. He will keep, you know, he will keep on making sure that the team, you know, runs the ball. Then you have other coaches that come out and it's really their plan. And then as soon as, you know, that happens, you know, they, they abandon. So we don't know yet 
exactly which camp you know the bears are going to fall in but i think certainly they want to run the ball as much as they can and we'll talk about their offensive weapons here in a minute but um running the ball sounds like a good plan whenever we start counting you know when we start you know detailing who the receivers and tight ends are about that man they want to lose let's let's call a spade a spade the chicago (laughs) bears do not want to win football games in the year 2022 and i don't think it looks good on fields no, it's not his fault, but with the new GM, new head coach coming in, like I just don't know how else to interpret this, Dwayne. Here are their offseason additions. Only players that they've added at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end during this offseason, including the NFL draft. Quarterback Trevor Simeon, running back Treston Ebner, Darrington Evans, and Kari Blassingame. Wide receiver Velas Jones, Byron Pringle, Tajay Sharp, Equinemia St. Brown, David Moore, who just got arrested, I believe, Dante Pettis, tight end Ryan Griffin, James O'Shaughnessy, and Ryson John, who I didn't know was a real thing until I started doing this Bears preview. Like, how else are we supposed to interpret that, Dwayne? Like, not only did they just not resign any of their meaningful veterans, a couple of whom actually did some okay things last year, but to just fade free agency and the draft, like these are the moves that a team should be making. And you know, the Texans kind of stratosphere, I understand it from that standpoint, but you just got your first round quarterback. The clock's ticking. I don't know that fading a complete season like this is the best thing to do when you have ideally the hopefully good quarterback on his rookie contract. Yeah, man, I have no clue what they're doing. Um, you know, I don't know if they've got money issues or what the deal is. I haven't even looked at their cap situation, um, so I don't, I don't know exactly. I can't quote offhand. We need we need Brad to to jump on with us, but I don't I don't know if that's part of it or if it's just you know some of these teams for whatever reason like they'll go into this mode for a couple of years of we're just going to pinch pennies or whatever. Um, you know, so I, I I don't know, man. I can't explain it, but like you know, when Byron Pink Pringle is like your top signing, and like fine, Byron Pring- Pringle is a quality like fourth option right to have on your team like knowing that you're going to need to run him out there and start him after losing Allen robinson you know that that's problematic obviously draft capital they don't have a lot because they could they always trade it away you know um they were able to move back up in the draft by trading or not up in the draft but they were able to secure you know a third round pick through trading khalil mack which i mean i don't i don't know how much that really helps your team this year you know with how often people miss on third round picks but you know they're just in a weird situation i don't know what the money thing is but they don't have draft picks so it's just it's it's hard to really build much around justin fields with the way uh ryan pace you know left this thing sitting so I'm looking at it right now, courtesy of overthecap.com, and the top three teams in both actual cap space and then effective cap space, which is basically putting down the team to the 51, at least 51 players in its projected rookie class onto the roster. Like it's the Browns that have the most, but that's a little bit skewed because obviously they're doing their, you know, little Watson bullshit mm-hmm. for year one. And the Cowboys are in third. Oh man, did you guys really have to go trade Amari Cooper? But the Bears right there with the second most. Again, I just I just think they want to lose. And um, I'm not sure how we can look through these transactions and deem anything uh, other than that. So just real quickly, uh, we're not going to spend much time time going through these individual ones but i will list them off as we have done for every teams this was a freaking grind going through these Dwayne, and you're going to realize why as i get through these names but leaving the squad nick Foles for the colts andy dalton for the saints brought in trevor simeon of course we had to also sign the goat nathan peterman to get in that quarterback room at running back Tariq cohen unrestricted free agent unfortunately ruptured his achilles during an offseason workout damian williams went ahead and signed with the falcons running back slash fullback ryan nall signed with the cowboys then we have Darrington Evans signed with the Bears. Kari Blassett game signed with the Bears. Also lost Allen Robinson, Jakeem Grant, Demir Bird, Marquise Goodwin. They did go ahead and sign Byron Pringle, Tasha Sharp, Equinemius St. Brown, David Moore, and Dante Pettis. Jimmy Graham and his no trade clause remain an unrestricted free agent. So does Jesse James. JP Holt signed with the Saints. Jesper Horstead signed with the Raiders. And again, to replace them, Ryan Griffin, James O'Shaughnessy, and Ryson John. So really, Dwayne, like the two, in my opinion, most impactful picks out of all this are probably the draft picks. Felix Jones, Tennessee wide receiver in the third round, and potentially Baylor running back Treston Ebner in the sixth round. Like, I mean, you said like Byron Pringle getting, I think, four million guaranteed was like their most impactful signing. And Byron Pringle's fine. But come on, man. It's Byron Pringle. It's totally a, a, you know, a line from Major League. Who are these guys? Like, you know, this guy's like, dead. <laughs> this guy's dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't have anything to add to any of that. Yeah. Jesper Horstead. Let's do it. 
going to the quarterback room. Justin Fields, Trevor Simeon, and Nathan Peterman. At least it is going to be the Justin Fields show, as long as he is healthy enough to do so. And last year, we did see good to go along with the bad. Like, if you look at Justin Fields, just his big-time throw highlight tape, you will see some just, you know, like I just said, big-time throws again and again, particularly in that Pittsburgh game where he was just able to really keep that minute. And, you know, one of the worst officiating on calls of the year was when that Bears linebacker just literally accidentally stepped into the uh, referee got the flag and kind of swung the dynamic of that whole game but Fields actually had the single largest difference last year in big time throw rate rank versus turnover worthy play rate so the past guys to do that you know to achieve this honor Dwayne Drew Locke Jameis Winston and Ryan Fitzpatrick so not exactly the best group to be in but you know what in second place was Matthew Stafford we saw Mahomes pop here it's if you're going to be making, you know, a lot of these riskier throws that are going to lead to big time throws, you're going to see the turnovers also kind of stack up. But the fact that Fields was able to pull off again, some of these uh, throws that PFF deems to be at another level was at least encouraging to see relative to a bunch of the other rookie quarterbacks that weren't even really close to him in this metric. Got to remember, though, all this is being said with the reality that Fields really wasn't given much of a chance to succeed. On the season, the Bears had the NFL's single lowest rate of pass catchers considered open or wide open on the season. You look at the offensive line that PFF grades as the, let's see, 31st ranked offensive line entering 2022. The receiving uh, corp is the single worst unit per PFF entering next season. So, Did you call I, it a receiving corpse? Is it corpse? Core? Core. <laughs> I messed no, this I think, one up I think a lot. corpse might be appropriate for this receiving <laughs> unit. But anyway, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, for for me, the, the biggest <laughs> thing, you know, with Fields, um, you know, like it's kind of alarming is just the fact that his fantasy points per drop back were 0. 0.42, right? Typically, if you've got a running quarterback, it's almost always over a 0. 0.5. And a lot of times you'll see, like for example, Jalen Hurts last year was a 0. 0.63. Um, you look at Josh Allen, obviously an elite player, 0. 0.58. But like, if we go back to Tim Tebow, he was like a 0. 0.6. You know, and, and we know Tebow couldn't even throw a ball. So uh, that's the one big concerning thing for me with Fields. But I am really just chalking it up to one, a player that you know was in and out of the lineup. He had some injuries. They never really got into any sort of rhythm with him. Um, we've already talked about how this coaching staff, this coaching staff, is actually probably perfect for you know this. Uh, the type of offense that they're going to have to run because the ownership refuses to spend any dollars on these players. Um, it's probably the perfect, you know, storm for Justin Fields. It's, it's probably the best that we could hope for, given that he has this lack of weapons, because I think they will involve him more, you know, in the running game. Um, and, you know, last year we did see in a few games, you know, where Fields was actually out there. You know, if you look at week eight, he finishes the QB four. Week nine finishes the QB nine. Got hurt and knocked out of week 11. Um, finished as the QB 29 that week, but then he missed week 12 and 13, came back weeks 14 and 15, um, finished as the QB eight and as the QB 12. So he's clearly demonstrated, you know, that, you know, once you can kind of get rolling, um, you know, he has an upside. He has an upside to be in the top 12 quarterbacks each week because of his rushing ability. Um, we just never fully saw that unleashed, you know, consistently over over last season for multiple reasons. First four starts had 3.75 rush attempts per game. Last five, 8.4. If you just take the overall season average of 6.3 rush attempts per game, that extrapolated over the course of 17 games gives you 108. PFF projections actually have him much higher than that at 140, which, hey, based on the new staff, you know, hopefully diving into more of the read option looks and things of that nature he can't flirt with because, Dwayne, that 125 carry mark kind of has been a magic number for highly fantasy relevant quarterbacks because 11 of 12 quarterbacks to get at least 125 carries in a season went on the post top 12 fantasy production on a per game basis. So again, not, not doing the total numbers. These guys had 125 carries. They played the entire season 11 of 12 on a per game basis were considered QB ones. The only one that wasn't 2020 cam Newton, who <sighs> I guess would be, you know, a decent, the, the way the passing game for the Bears is looking, it really is possible that Fields could get a little bit closer to where Cam's going, but that kind of seems like the floor, man. I would say a kind of a mid-tier QB2 if he's not going to give us anything through the air, and I still think the ceiling could potentially be the Konami code Jalen Hurts type of year that we just saw where we look up and it's just one kind of borderline QB1 performance after another after another, and by the end of the year, we're talking about a legit 
top 10 quarterbacks. So this is where it's interesting, Dwayne, because I know the tier of quarterbacks right in front of him. They fit real nicely together. They're all veteran pass first guys, cousins, Carr, Rogers, Stafford. And then we're usually putting fields behind them. And that's where he's going in drafts. But why not move? And I, I've done, I've already done this. So I'm asking you why not, why not move fields ahead of cousins and Carr just to ensure that we get more fields there? Because I know, the Stafford Rogers cousins car tier that fits nicely. And we want to put fields after it, but I want fields over cousins and car. We're not getting that same sort of Konami code upside at all with them. And with fields, again, we saw those last four starts all produce top 12 performances. And that was on a horrific offense. The offense is still unfortunately horrific, but we have seen him at least for a portion of the year. Give us some upside. Why not prioritize fields again, ahead of cousins and car. Um, just because I think that I can make the same argument that that Cousins and Carr have Tom Brady arbitrage, right? Just like I can say Justin Fields has Jalen Hurts. Um, you know, so it's like, and I'm still getting plenty of Justin Fields where he's at. So ADP is also part of it. Um, and it's still like where I've got him ranked. If you're using my rankings, you're still going to get a lot of Justin Fields. Basically, when you miss on the other guys, you're still going to get Fields. Or for some reason, Stafford, Rogers, Carr, Cousins are your first quarterback off the board. You're probably going to turn around and also get Justin Fields added to that. If you didn't happen to take Trey Lance, you know, a little bit earlier. So um, I actually like the way it works out. I don't, I don't disagree, you know, with you know, with your thought process. But the other thing with Stafford, um, Carr, and Cousins, like I, man. I love the stacks I can play with their players. I can get Justin Jefferson. I can get Adam Thielen. I can get Irv Smith, Derek Carr. I can have Renfro, Waller, Devontae Adams, um, Stafford. I've got Cooper Cup going up top. Allen Robinson, Tyler Higby. You can get late. You know, Daryl Henderson is basically free in drafts. So there's just so many more options with those guys. Whereas, like with the Bears, it's like, okay, we've got Darnell Mooney. Did you get him? Okay, great. <laughs> Cole Kmet. <laughs> um, so that's the other part. And especially so in best ball, I'm much more likely to lean to the other guys. And what I'll do with Fields is I don't mind just playing him naked. I don't feel like I have to stack Justin Fields. Yeah. Like if, if I get Justin Fields and you know, obviously Mooney's already gone, I'll try to stack. I'll, I'll prioritize Komet over some of the other guys that we talk about in our tight end tiers when I have Fields. Um, and then, you know, I'll throw a chip on Pringle with like, you know, the 18th round, 17th round pick sometimes when I get Fields, but I don't, it's not as big of a priority for me, right? Whereas I don't want Kirk Cousins, you know, naked. You know, I don't I don't know if anybody wants to see Kirk Cousins naked, but I especially don't want him without his weapons. I don't want Derek Carr without his weapons. So there is a pivot. When I get to a point in a draft, like Derek Carr, you heard everybody of that name, like they all go in the first, I mean, Hunter Renfro goes in the seventh round. He's the latest right now for the Raiders. Kirk Cousins, pretty much, uh, well, you can still get Irv Smith in like round 13 or so, but his starting wide receivers are gone. So if I'm in a situation where I didn't get any of those, that's also the other time, Ian, where I will prioritize Justin Fields. And I'll be like, hey, I don't have any of the stacks for these other guys. Now, Rodgers is always still in play because his receivers all go later because nobody knows who to, who to draft except for the overpriced Alan Lazard. Um, so some a lot of times I will look at Rodgers and Fields. So I think there's still... I'm I'm basically with you. I'm just strategizing like when am I going to choose to go to the go the Justin Fields route? I guess the big question folks might ask us is like if I have one draft, right? If I only get to draft one team, like would I rather have Rodgers, Carr, Cousins, etc.? And I would say my answer is ultimately still the same. If you started off your team with one or two weapons from those offenses, why not go all in on them? If you didn't, then pivot to fields, right? He gives you more upside. You don't have to worry about the stack at all um, because he has the rushing upside you talked about, Ian. On one team, I would prefer to actually get a quarterback in the tier ahead of the Stafford and Rodgers guys and then come back and have fields as your kind of late round lottery ticket, if at all. If you miss on them and you already have a Kyler, just go with one quarterback. It's fine. You can play the streaming game later because after fields, Dwayne, in a one QB redraft league, I don't really think there's anyone else worth putting, you know, a lottery ticket. No, mostly just streamers, to be honest. Like some of those guys, they'll get drafted and some of them will, you know, they might come through a little bit, but a lot of them will be released you know even yeah. if they get drafted so um yeah i'm fine with playing the wire once you get past justin fields and just so folks know like for context that's that's to uh lawrence winston mac jones uh zach wilson daniel jones baker mayfield's kind of in that group now yeah. jared goff all of those guys 
All right, moving on to the running back room. Dave Montgomery, Khalil Herbert, Darrington Evans, and Treston Ebner. Now, looking at Montgomery, surpassed 1,000 total yards each of his first three seasons. You know, obviously had that ESPN graphic back in the day that made him out to be a complete world beater among world beaters. Hasn't maybe looked quite that good. Still solid, though. I must admit, though, Dwayne, I was a little bit underwhelmed when kind of looking at some of his advanced uh, statistics. So, since entering the league, 93 running backs with at least 100 carries. Montgomery is 32nd in PFF rushing grade, 72nd in yards per carry, 65th in yards after contact per carry, 22nd in missed tackles force per carry. Haven't seen a ton of ability to create some explosive runs. I don't think he's quite as much of a plotter as some people make him out to be. I think the Bears' offensive line generally not being great and opening up that big of holes has been an issue. But man, Dwayne, 278 touches per season since 2019 really hasn't mattered because he we've shown we've seen him have the ability to work across all three downs and actually handle a pretty decent pass game role with for the majority of time that Tariq Cohen was out and injured. So million dollar question: Will this usage continue? I don't know, man. Eberflus with the Colts and is it Eberflus? Eberflus like Bears fans might just have already. Yeah. Ready to kill me. Like, how do you say <laughs> his last name? I say Everflus. That's Everflus. the way I've heard it pronounced, um, which I don't think he's really going to have any bearing on. No, on his, but I'm just stuff. saying, I, I I would think so. I would think probably not, but he is coming from a Colts team that has leaned heavily on committees in the past. Getsy, you know, looking at him and what we've most recently seen with the Packers. Hey, he saw Aaron Jones for three straight years, not exactly get the sort of uses that they were hoping for. I'm not sure if just again, with coaches that have not been with this team before, if Dave Montgomery is going to be much better, better enough than Khalil Herbert, then even freaking Ebner to continue to get this massive usage. I think there was a lot more rationale for Nagy and pays to feed the ball. David Montgomery with him being the most invested in running back. I'm not so sure that plays the same way anymore. So with Montgomery, I just, man, you look at Eberflus already talking up Ebner a little bit, who I know you have some things to say about Dwayne. Khalil Herbert was better than Montgomery and based on every single meaningful statistic last year. It's not that I don't think Montgomery won't lead the backfield. I think he'll be the leader in probably every single category, but 278 touches, man, I would probably take the under on that. And that's why I just have that hard of a time getting with Montgomery because I don't think the efficiency is going to go up. You could argue the targets are at a greater risk than ever in the new offense and with Justin Fields under center, more likely to scramble than check down. And like, my God, we know he's not going to make it out of this by getting a nice touchdown total to kind of make up for all this. So Montgomery, my RB20, and just someone that, Dwayne, like if there is an RB dead zone, I think this is kind of it because I'm just taking wide receivers at this range. Yeah, it's the dead zone. Um, you know, I think you hit it. Like his profile just does not stand out really in any way. It's just right. basically meh, you know. <laughs> um, so anytime you have a player that's meh and you have a new coaching staff coming in, I think that there certainly is risk. It's not that really any of these other backs really scare me, right? I like Khalil Herbert, but we probably romanticize him like a little bit, you know, much as, as well. I do think that he is a good, you know, guy that you can get later in drafts, you know, that can be a, you know, kind of like an Alexander Madison, you know, like you mentioned earlier in the off season, that's at a discount, you know, so I, I like him, but I'm also wondering, like, does a guy like Tristan Ebner, who is a great receiver in college out of Baylor, you know, his PFF receiving grades were like off the chart, like, you know, now it's a five-year player. Right. So it's an older back um, coming out of college, but, you know, maybe he carves out some sort of a role. So I think there's just enough, you know, risk to your point that also the strategy, you know, is just to pivot off. Look, in fourth round, folks, like is is a key round. So right now, if you're drafting on DraftKings, you're drafting on, you know, underdog, um, even over on F F F on FFPC, like all of these formats. Like once you get to the round, once you get to round four, man, once like acres is off the board, it's like, I'm pretty much done. My only target left is Brees Hall. And he kind of goes all over the place. Like you'll see him go at the first, the fourth round. You'll see him go at the beginning of the fifth round. So you can't, if you're building your roster, like in the early rounds and you're picking from early position, um, I typically like to have two backs in, you know, coming into the fourth round, just because one, it lines up where I think the backs that we're getting, you know, down at the early position of drafts, you know, we don't normally get what we're getting right now in round two and round three um, in years past. And it's also because of this, like yeah. once you get to that fourth round, like it's a big drop off, like once acres goes off the board, um, especially once Brees Hall's gone, because you're staring at a bunch of guys that you really don't want to click on. 
And I think that's also the time in the draft that we're getting a lot of Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson exposure into the fifth and sixth round. So if Montgomery does fall into the later fifth, early sixth, and know you find yourself going wide receiver heavy, that's fine. As we always say, don't hate the player, hate the ADP. But man, like Montgomery versus guys like, you know, Bateman, Brandon Cooks, even his teammate Darnell Mooney. I just think I'm going to be pulling the trigger on the wide receivers or the quarterback at that point. Uh, to what you were saying, like, yeah. ETN, Akers, Brees. I mean, I just want all these guys ahead of Montgomery at this point. I mean, I'm taking Zeke ahead of him. Kamara, even with his issues, you know, is still should be going there. I take Montgomery over, you know, the guys that were a lot more certain there's going to be a committee with Cordero Patterson, AJ Dillon, Elijah Mitchell, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, Miles Sanders, Antonio Gibson. Like, I'm taking Montgomery over them. And look, his ADP is RB20. So I, I don't think, Dwayne, you probably have him ranked that much lower than that. So it's not that we're overly down on Montgomery, but it's like, man, when we have these questions and it's in the Bears offense, like, to what you like to say about a lot of these guys, Dwayne, are we going to be sitting here in four or five months? Like, my God, why did we not draft more Dave Montgomery? I really don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. I, I, I think, you know, I have him at RB20, um, but I just, I look at him as someone that, yeah, we're projecting him. You know, the, the way he gets to RB20 is we're projecting him for a, a big workload, right? Whereas, and we're doing the same thing, you know, for Cam Akers and Ezekiel Elliott, but I like their offenses, right? So it's like, if the Rams hit and all of a sudden decide to run the ball more, right? Inside the five yard line, instead of throwing it all the time, like they did last year, like Cam Akers, like I can make an argument that even though we don't, we may not think Akers is as special as some people do, but we think he could be solid. He could score 15 rushing touchdowns in his offense, right? Like Montgomery just doesn't have these different paths because we're so worried about the bears offense as well. And the talent profile, whereas with Akers and Zeke, yeah, we may have questions about where they are, you know, from a talent profile versus where they used to be but they play in really good offenses that should score a lot of points. So for me, I like leaning to those guys, you know, over Montgomery. And it's also just makes Montgomery somebody that I think I've taken maybe once or twice. And it's been exactly the scenario you've said, Ian, where everybody's just avoiding him. It's like the waters are parting. Like, and here comes David Montgomery walking, you know, down the aisle to me two rounds after ADP. And I'm like, all right, David, come on, let's do this. Let's do this. Last year, RB9 and expected PPR points per game, just RB14 and realized PPR points per game. That's the problem. If those expected go down, like he's just going to need to be a lot better than he's been in order to make up for it. And again, based on the history we've seen with these dual threat quarterbacks, not exactly um, enhancing their running backs receiving value. I don't really think Montgomery has, uh, as you said before, Dwayne, he he doesn't have many outs uh, this year with, I think, the way this Bears offense is setting up. With Khalil Herbert, where is he going right now? Over at underdog fantasy rb49 i think that's a reasonable spot i will say similar to madison i think more as i've kind of dove into these teams it's concerning when you have the coaching staff switch to assume that the handcuff is going to have the same role if shit goes south again particularly when we now have someone like ebner who uh, he's a six round guy maybe he doesn't even make the team like we're not freaking out about um ebner necessarily but they also added Darrington Evans. Like these are guys that the coaching staff has gone out of their way to add that seem to have that pass down skill set more um not saying Herbert or Montgomery can't catch passes, but right. these are the sort of scat backs that you don't, I almost don't like seeing added because to me that says there's a higher chance of a committee a situation arising. Yeah, Cause it's almost and, like they have a very specific thing in mind. For yes, the player. exactly. Yeah. So I'm with you. Yeah. I've totally cooled on Herbert after just really studying, you know, Ebner more. <laughs> yeah. I've got exposure earlier on. I think he's fine where you're getting him to your point. You get him, you know, at um, RB 49 on FFPC as well. So thanks fantasy mojo, actually 51. So right around the same, you got a 51 and a 49. I've got him ranked as my RB 49. So it, it's fine. You can get exposure, but I'm not going out of my way earlier in the off season. I felt like I gravitated to Herbert quite a bit, you know, in those later rounds, I'm like, oh, I'm Khalil Herbert, Khalil Herbert. Now it's kind of like, eh, okay, I'll mix him in with some of these yeah. other guys. Let's talk a little wide receiver here. Darnell Mooney, Vilas Jones Jr., Byron Pringle, Equinemia St. Brown, Dante Pettis, Tajay Sharp, and David Moore for now. So word out of Bears OTAs. Always appreciate the hard work that the athletic of you know the athletics beat writers are putting into all that coverage. Mooney, Pringle, and Jones looking as the Bears top three receivers as training camp begins. And honestly, those are probably the only three guaranteed to make the roster at this point, just based on the way the money is kind of distributed uh throughout the whole room. So last year, Mooney. Mooney did just basically take over the offense from a hobbled slash, is it fair to say, maybe a little bit disinterested Allen Robinson proportions of the year. And, you know, fair play to him for doing so. 
I guess my thing with Mooney though, Dwayne, is we haven't exactly I like I don't think Mooney is nearly as good as someone like Terry McLaurin or Brandon Cooks, like this number one in a bad offense. I, I think that we see McLaurin and Cooks, their underlying statistics really pop out. And this just hasn't quite been there at Mooney. He's not bad, but I also don't think that he's this great wide receiver that we're not paying enough attention to just because he's on the Bears. 78 wide receivers have at least 100 targets since 2019. Mooney ranks 52nd in PFF receiving grade, 59th in yards per route run, 56th in yards per reception, and 45th in targets per route run. So, hey, when we're in an offense that's giving him all these targets, he's able to make do with it. But I look at last year. He got 140 targets. He you know, barely clears 1,000 yards. He gets four touchdowns. He was the wide receiver 31 in uh, PPR points per game, and it was actually the 18th highest uh, mark and expected PPR points per game. So it's a great workload, Dwayne, but the talent just doesn't really seem to be there. Now, with that said, I don't think Beelish Jones or Byron Pringle necessarily have you know enough talent to really overtake him uh, in their own right as number one guy. But man, Mooney, see him go as the wide receiver 28 over an underdog. I'm not lower on it, but I would be taking guys like Rashad Bateman, Amon Ross St. Brown, and of course, Jerry Judy, who I just think are more talented, even if we're giving up potentially 10 or 15 targets on the season. Yeah, like for me with Mooney, like looking at the quarterbacks and stuff that he's played with and in the offense, like taking that all into context, like the numbers you just gave aren't that bad. <laughs> you know, having yeah. a 1.72 yards per route run on the Bears is probably like having like a 2.3, you know, on the Chiefs. Um, so because quarterback play does affect the yards per route run. The, the biggest thing that I look at for Mooney, um, I'm with you. I'm not reaching for him, but I do wonder if we're under, underestimating his talent. I mean, 25% target share on, on an offense that, you know, wasn't that creative didn't do a lot, you know, to scheme a lot of different things open. And really you're the only thing that the off that defensive coordinators had to worry about all last year. So I, I have a feeling that Mooney's, you know, probably better than what we think, you know, he's a fifth round pick. So he wasn't a guy that we were super excited about coming out as a rookie. And I wonder if we're kind of clinging onto that, you know, to a little bit, you know, a little bit, but I mean, 12.9 fantasy points per game, but isn't going to get you, you know, super excited. You know, he was the wide receiver 23 last year and total fantasy points with 220, uh, which I mean, it's fine. Like, I mean, it's a good wide receiver three, um, but usually Mooney, you know, is just off the board and it's a, uh, if, if I do get Mooney, that'll probably be the drafts where I will, I, I'll actually really try to get fields, you know, if I can, because if there's any chance of having a funnel on this team, it's going to be through Mooney. I will say that, you know, if Getsy deploys some of the things that we think that he will, right, based on his roots, to your point, we don't really know for sure exactly what it will look like. Um, but if they do some things to really create more space for Mooney, you know, run after the catch type stuff, you know, more schemed up stuff versus, you know, everybody running, you know, a three yard hitch. Um, you know, I think like that's, uh, I think that might've been the favorite play for, for Matt Nagy, but, um, I think if they do some things like that, that could help him. Um, but, but at the end of the day, like I'm fine with where his ADP is at. I've got Darnell Mooney ranked as my wide receiver 31. He's going off the board at FFPC at wide receiver 27 over on underdog. He's going off at 28. So I've got him in my tier three B, um, you know, so I'm updating these today. Um, he it's, he's in there with Elijah Moore. Um, Devonta Smith, actually their talent profiles are stronger, um, but they've got a little bit more target competition, right? And they all have kind of quarterback, you know, questions, but we could say Mooney has the biggest quarterback question. Um, the other guy that I moved into that tier is, uh, DK Metcalf, but you guys can read this tomorrow. Oh my goodness, Dwayne with, yeah. Where do I have Mooney ranked exactly? Wide receiver 28. So I guess I'm actually a little higher on, on, on him than you are, despite us uh, maybe having different uh, kind of energy tones there when talking about him. Adam Thielen, Amari Cooper. I'm taking Mooney ahead of them because I think, again, the target total could just be ridiculous. I guess the Drake, London, Devontae Smith tier is when it gets interesting. So it really is, Dwayne. I mean, look, I went back and I watched every single one. He had 81 receptions last year. He went back and watched them all. He had the sick, like 60 yard touchdown against the Ravens where he broke a couple tackles, but just didn't see much, man. He looked like the number, the number one wide receiver that they decided they're going to throw the ball to 140 times. And he got what was there. Never did. I never was. I like, man, that was a nasty route by Darno Mooney. The guy's premier highlight from his rookie year was a overthrow by Nick Foles when Ramsey was clearly sitting on a slant that like they sent eight guys. So of course, Ramsey wasn't really going to care uh, if Mooney ran a double move, which he did. And they couldn't complete it accordingly. Like, have you been, you, you watched these bears games. Has there, has there ever been a point where you're just like, man, Darnell Mooney. Like I, 
I don't know if he has the dog in him, Dwayne. Like that's my point here. Yeah, I, I don't know, but I know that it's pretty hard to create twenty five percent target share. If you suck, it's just not possible. Like if you're a really bad player, there's no way you can get to twenty five percent. They can design everything they want, and you're still just not going to get there. Um, I mean, we've just seen too many players play on offenses where there's nobody. And yet nobody can come up and take a 25% target share, right? Like the highest player on the team will be an 18 percenter. Yeah. Um, so I, it, I agree. Like when I watch him, like he doesn't just pop off, you know, to me, but at the same time, I know there's something there um, because you can't just design all of that. It's, it's, you know, he's good enough that he's creating some targets. So I would expect him to be somewhere around the same target share. And I think that, you know, he has a range of outcomes that he could be lower than that. Um, but he could also surprise us and have a larger target share than what we're talking about. Because I mean, like, go look at, go like filter down on wide receivers in their second year that had a 25% target share. Like it's a pretty strong list. I know, and he's got the target share, but this would be one of the rare situations where it kind of could be an exception. Maybe I, man, I just feel like he's like. The hey, one look, there, there, there are always exceptions. Just yeah. like we want to make exceptions, you know, for guys that have never demanded targets, right? They get to play with a new quarterback. Like it goes both ways. And guess what? Sometimes exceptions hit. Like, but overall, I don't, I don't think it matters much. Like we're, we're kind of splitting hairs. We're close on him. You know, yeah. we have him, in, we have him within two spots of each other. We have him within two spots of ADP. Um, we've both said we're not going to be overweight on him, but we don't mind taking him, you know, when it works out right. And historically, even being on a bad offense, like I went back, I looked at the bottom 10 scoring offenses over the past 10 years, and the top wide receiver from those finished as the wide receiver 32 and full PPR scoring, 20 instances of them having a top 24 receiver, 20 of them not having anyone higher than 35th. So yeah, I would say Mooney's fine where he's going, and we can move on and talk about these other just enthralling uh, wide receivers here. Vilas Jones, look, you're not going to take him in a redraft league. I don't think you should. But, like, Dwayne, I think the the hate's gone too far. I could see Vilas Jones, like, doing some really good things in the preseason and starting the season and people just not changing their mind all because he's 25 years old. I get it. But the dude also runs a 4-3-1, and he's probably going to start, and he just got third-round draft capital. Like, if we just ignored the age thing, and I know it's a piece of the puzzle, but – like everything else about him seems pretty cool, man. The dude had put some fun plays on film at Tennessee. He was stuck, you know, behind the reason why he didn't break out late was because he was stuck behind some very good wide receivers at USC. I mean, you know, we're not really holding Jamison Williams late breakout against him. Not the same age, not the same situation, but I just, I get the feeling with Vilas Jones that I've gotten from some players over the past few years where it just seems like they get written off before we even see them play a snap. And I don't want to do that, Dwayne. So I guess that's my point. Like, I don't, I'm not sitting here saying you should draft Vilas Jones. If you have fields and you want to throw a literal last round dart at him, that's fine. But let's chill out on writing him off before he even plays a freaking snap only because he's 25 years old when he does have a lot of other things potentially going in his way. Yeah, I'm gonna write him off. You don't have to. I've got him in Why? my I've got him in my last tier because like the profile just doesn't really hit. Like, so what if it does? Like, I'll just live with it. Like, and I mean, it's on an many... offense where and it's on an offense where it's not gonna matter anyway. So it's like it's nothing personal against Velas Jones, but like if I do all of this research, right? And I look at all these players over all these years and we're like looking, just trying to play probabilities, like what's the point in doing it if I'm just gonna turn around and take a guy like Velas Jones? Right? I'm not saying to take him, but like let's not let's watch him play some I, He's getting I'm like, fine with you. I'm fine with you. I'm not. If Velas Jones wants to prove us wrong, fine. Yes. You know, he's getting, but I mean, what do you have to do to prove, more, but, but, but what do you have to do to prove, you know, yourself wrong? Like, I mean, we just talked about a player that's actually earned a 25% target share, you know, after being a fifth round pick what, that we're still not that excited about. So like Velas Jones is like, going to actually have to like move the moon out of orbit, like to get people excited about him. But I, I'm always willing to change my mind. I'm just coming in with, with the profile we have on him right now, right now he got a bump and he's actually in my tears for best ball, you know, to be a last round pick whenever you have Justin Fields, you know, in round 20, if you're over on something like DraftKings or around 18 over on underdog, because of what you just said, he's a third round pick. So we're saying there's a chance, but it's not someone obviously that you're going to be prioritizing, but you know, he could be someone we're talking about on the waiver wire. Like if he comes out and blows up, you know, in week one, like we'll have a conversation. Um, right. Like I'll, st I would still be waiting it against the profile, right? Saying, okay, like if we're talking about Fab and you got a thousand dollars to spend, Felix Jones went off for 120 yards and two touchdowns. Like, is this like a 40% guy? 
right? Or is this a 10% guy? Like I'm probably still going to lean 10 to 10%, but I'm not going to say it's a guy just to not bid on. You know what I mean? So like, it's just all, it's all relative, you know, and it's tough for me to dismiss the stuff because it's like, we put so much time and research and effort into it, trying to play the odds and they don't always work out. There are always exceptions to your point with everything we do um, as good as we try to be. And I know you're on the record saying that you and I are going to be 110% right on every pick this year. So we're trying, um, but maybe uh, th this is one where, um, well, we'll still be the same anyway. We probably have him ranked. <laughs> you know, I have him at wide receiver 98. So, hey, I've got him above ADP. His ADP wow. on FFPC is 111, and I have Velas Jones as 98. But, yeah, I mean, I, I just, again, he seems to be the poster child of the guy that if he would have gone the fourth round, no one would be even caring about this, and they'd probably be talking more about the opportunity. So, I'm. I agree with everything you just said. Good, Dwayne. You're gonna we're gonna watch what happens in August and September and make our changes according. I just want to make sure that we are all realizing that we should be both putting most of our weight on Beelish Jones behind what he does in August and September and Look, beyond, as opposed to you know our freaking age model from March. Yeah, I mean, well, the age model is like from years and years and years, but like the the point being there aren't that many receivers that come out this late anyway. So it's like, not like your comparison group is that big. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, look, and anything can happen. We know this. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, Vilas Jones, somebody find late if you want him and you've got, you know, Justin Fields on your team. Um, just and Byron Pringle are really treating the same way. I've only got those two receivers. I've got them seven spots apart. <laughs> I've got Byron Pringle at uh, 91. And I've got Velas Jones at 98. So it's like, I kind of feel the same way about, you know, two bears weapons, you know, that we don't think are going to be, you know, it's probably going to be mostly Darnell Mooney, Cole Komet. We'll talk about in a minute. These, these two guys, though, maybe one of them can come through, but it's just, you know, it's also not an offense that we're that excited about, but I have to just say, look, I've got to pat myself, maybe not on the back, but I'm ahead of ADP on Velas Jones. So whatever you can't, you can't, you can't hate on me now, Ian. I cannot. I have Velas 93 and Byron Pringle 94. So I, I, I get it. Look they at you. Yeah. Really See, we're, right we're, so we're like within 10 spots on both of them. Pringle, I will say this because I, I do like to, I know you earn your targets, but it is interesting to me when we see guys like Calvin Ridley, for example, if you look at all the games where he's at eight plus targets, like he just doesn't miss. So I do like kind of giving their, you know, the game log, a quick little scroll on that. And Byron Pringle has popped out because he's only had five career games with, with seven or more targets in those games, six catches, 103 yards, touchdown, five catches for 56 yards, six catches, 75 yards, two touchdowns, five catches, 37 yards, two touchdowns, five catches, 29 yards, and a touchdown. Did make the most out of his opportunities when he was there, unlike teammate Demarcus Robinson. D didn't like, you know, grade out as this like horrific wide receiver on a per route efficiency basis. Byron Pringle, Dwayne, he does turn 29 in November, but Byron Pringle is arguably good. And you can't say that for pretty much anyone else on this depth chart. So yeah, just like Velas, I don't think it's someone that majority of people need to worry about and redraft. But if we do but to your point on Pringle last year, man, 23% of his targets went for 20 plus yards. Now he did play with Patrick Mahomes. So that's part of it, but still, you know, Josh Hermsmeyer's done the research wide receivers pretty much own the Ray dot, right? The, the quarterback can influence it, but you know, Pringle is a guy that we've seen, you know, really kind of do everything early in his career. He's more just underneath. And then he kind of developed that deep part of his game. So I think that's a positive yards after the catch. He's a plus player. You know, he's not like way above the NFL averages, but you know, he's, he's a little above average. And then if you look at his, his explosive play rate, so those are your targets or your receptions of 15 plus yards or more divided by your targets gives your explosive play rate. 26%, which is really good. So I think there's a part of, you know, Pringle's profile, you know, that was good enough that made me want to rank him basically. Right. Cause we have a bunch of guys like that. We don't even put in our ranks. Like, so he and Velas Jones, like they were good enough to at least make my last tier because of some of these things that we're talking about. And with Pringle, like it, it wouldn't surprise us. Like if we came out and it was really like more of a one, a one B like with him yeah. and Darnell Mooney, like that's possible. And maybe the bears just love guys that come out of college when they're older, because Pringle was also older, right. When he came out of college. So, um, yeah, I I'm fine. And, and, and look, mostly like you're never taking these two players unless you've got Justin Fields on your team. Maybe you're looking at that Detroit bears game stack and you're trying to be contrarian and, and, you know, best ball mania three. And let's say you've got, whatever Jamison Williams who you took a little later and you're hoping he comes on you're like ah, oh, you know I'm sitting here I got nothing else to do I'll throw a shot on Byron Pringle I think it's fine you know in those cases and you might get lucky and he might be worth a little bit more but yep. again it's an offense we're not that excited about overall so it's tough to get too carried away 
basically on the Bears, you got Justin Fields, Dave Montgomery, Darnell Mooney, and the fourth actually fantasy relevant guy is Cole Komet. Also have Ryan Griffin and James O'Shaughnessy in the tight end room. Those are not Jags, Dwayne. I think Griffin and O'Shaughnessy have an underrated chance at carving out a role here. I understand Komet had the every down role last year. I understand that Jimmy Graham was really just a thorn in the side. He was taking away the red zone work. That's why Cole Komet, despite having 60 receptions, couldn't even find the end zone once. And also realizes Jesper Horstead, who left this team, including the preseason, he had five touchdowns on like 13 targets, Dwayne. So I, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of excuses being made for Cole Komet, I would say. And when you look at his production, and you checked me on one of one of these episodes, Dwayne, on where I was comparing a young tight end against veteran tight ends, and that was not fair. So I've tried to right my wrongs and you know be better about that in the future. So I took Komet against every single tight end in their first two seasons of their career since 2015 that earned at least 50 targets. There were 36 instances. Among those 36 tight ends, Komet ranks 24th in PFF receiving grade, 27th in yards per route run, 29th in yards per reception, 19th in targets per route run. Man, like, what what are we expecting to happen here? We saw Getze, once again, not for sure that he's going to run the Packers offense, but we saw Robert Tunyon score freaking 12 touchdowns or whatever he did in 2020 comes back in 2021. Dude was barely cracking the 50% snap rate by the time the season started. So Cole Komet, I feel like the entire lure of him is how much he was running routes in a different offense that again, still use Jimmy Graham and these other guys, but Getsy, just like Nathaniel Hackett and my concerns in Denver about Albert O like, I'm not convinced that Cole Komet is a good enough tight end for this coach that has seen nothing other than tight end committees to all of a sudden throw that away. Like Cole Komet to me, prioritizing him ahead of these other late round tight ends on easily the worst offense because we kind of think he's going to get the volume. It's a big leap for me, man. He's only 23 years old. So maybe he's going to see his efficiency boom here. I, I get it. Tight ends get better. But again, those were numbers against fellow young tight ends and he hasn't stood out at all. So and that's, I think, one maybe you consider just the ability to draw targets a little bit more of a talent than I do. I know it's very important, but I really would like to see one other metric than that Dwayne going in Komet's way. And right now there doesn't seem to be. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you're betting on a player that's younger that, you know, still has a better chance to break out than some of the dudes that are older. That's really all you're doing. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you know that tight ends take longer. Like to your point, like it, it, Cole Komet's numbers are not great. Like that's why you have seen you haven't seen me pumping him on Twitter. Haven't seen me. I haven't done anything right around. You, you know who the players are. I like if you follow me on Twitter. Like I I pretty much tweet about like those players, and it's more about archetypes really, right, <laughs> than just player takes. It's about guys that are checking all the right boxes. Komet checks one. He's young. He checks two. He did get to a targets per route run of 18% last year, which is a low end tight end one, right? So that's like tight end seven through 12 in a 12 team league. But to your point, like it's not like his, his PFF receiving grade has not been good. 56.9, 63.4. I mean, that, that 63.4 is meh at best, right? It's, it's not good. Um, yards per route run, you know, haven't been good. Now that can be influenced by the quarterback play and the offense that you're in a little bit. But the PFF receiving grade like tells the truth. Right. That's why I love going to that because it doesn't it doesn't necessarily care about your quarterback. It just cares like, did you do your job? And it says that right now, Cole Komet hasn't necessarily done that. So, yeah, if if I have seen there are certain people in the community that are out there pumping Komet is like, you know, he's he's the stake in the ground. Right. Got to have Komet. I, I don't feel that way. I, I have Komet in a tier. I've got Komet in the 2A tier, but I mean, tomorrow I'm reworking my tight end tiers. I'll probably slice this tier two up into like a few different, a, f a few more tiers. My tier two A is probably big, too, too big. Like it's got Pat Fryermuth, Dawson Knox, Irv Smith. I clearly feel different about those guys than I yeah. do Cole Komet. Like I have no question in my mind that I feel differently about them than Cole Komet. Um, you know, but then a tier after that, right. I'd feel more okay with Komet. But I mean, to your point, like it, it's not like I'm just because he's younger. I want to take him over Gerald Everett, or I want to take him over Hunter Henry or like, fine. I'd probably prioritize him over Robert Tunyon. Um, but I don't I know, man, when I look at Gerald Everett, I look at Hunter Henry, you know, Hunter Henry's shown that he can score touchdowns, Tyler Higby and Gerald Everett play in the AFC West. We've already talked about that ad nauseum. Like you're going to have shots to get these guys in shootout, especially in best ball, right? Tunyon, you're roster two or three. Go ahead. I was going to say Tunyon's shown he can score touchdowns and we're 
potentially looking at the same role. One's got Aaron Rodgers, one's got Justin Fields, a quarterback. Like, I, it's a, it's a conversation, and it's really I don't think being treated as close to that as it is on ADP. He's a tight end fourteen. I think he was actually a bit closer to that tight end one borderline. So once again, if he continues to slide and he's just in this mess, then okay, fine. But yeah, I'm not going all out on Cole freaking Komet in this man. I will gladly yeah, if, take those guys in the better offenses. Yeah, yeah. So if you have to take. Cole Kmet on underdog at 138, or you can have Gerald Everett at 157. Give me Gerald Everett. I'll take Hunter Hen- Henry at 150. I'll take Tyler Higby at 165. Hell, I'll take Noah Fant at 170 over Cole Kmet at 138. Yeah, I know we're talking about a bad offense in Seattle, but we're also probably talking about a bad offense with the Bears as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the ADP is the issue, right? And over on FFPC, which is tied in premium, he's going pick 107. Uh, whereas Gerald Everett and Hunter Henry and these other guys are 139, 132, 137. Um, I might lean to Cole Komet, uh, just give him a little bit more benefit of the doubt and redraft. Over on best ball, though, I'm really not messing with it. Um, like if I miss on my top tight end, like the cutoff is Zach Ertz. We've talked about that. Like if you miss on Zach Ertz, like I definitely want to come back and try to get an Albert O. I want to get a Nerf Smith. I want to get one of those two players. I would also be willing to go with Dawson Knox there. Um, if, once I get them, I'm trying to tack on two more and it's not like Cole Komet's like this big priority for me. Honestly, I'm more likely to, to just grab Gerald Everett and Tyler Higby and be like, okay, great. I've got AFC NFC West matchups plus breakout potential with the first guy that I took. And if you have fields, okay, then we can prioritize. You can swing it that way and stack them. But again, man, I, I really wouldn't be surprised if week one comes along and we see Komet far closer to like 60% of the snaps with Griffin and O'Shaughnessy eating into it. I mean, that's what they've really done at every step of their careers in New York and Jacksonville. And to me, like we've talked about, you know, Johnny Munt going to the Vikings, uh, Eric Tomlinson going to the Broncos. Like Johnny those, Munt. those are Johnny block. Munt. Yeah. But those are block first tight ends who are mm-hmm. never going to be, you know, they're going to have five targets on the entire season. Like Griffin and O'Shaughnessy have earned like 30, 40 plus targets in these different situations. So just really wouldn't write that off. And uh, again, I just think for someone like Komet, and I've used this a little bit with Judy, um, Jerry Judy in Denver as well. The high draft capital, means less to me after the person that used the drive all the people that use that high draft capital are no longer employed by the organization so it, it is a sign of talent and it's a sign that you know well, and there and there is also a difference between a first rounder and cole Komet. was was he a third or a second i'm trying he was, to remember he was a second so yeah but there's yeah, a difference so, either one yeah but i'm with you I, i'm with you man and and again the tight ends I, i'm sure people like want more flag plants from us and we have some like we have, Al- I have Alberto and Irv Smith, you yeah. know, you, you're huge on Irv Smith. Um, I have Zach Ertz tight end seven now too. So I'm, I'm getting there. Yeah. So, I mean, we're like, I've got Ertz as nine, but like, I wouldn't have no problem with him in seven. No, um, I'm saying, I, oh, Ertz. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I thought you just said you had Ertz at seven, but um, I do have Ertz at seven. Okay. Yeah. This is um, fantastic podcasting. <laughs> yeah, we we really know our ranks, don't we? But yeah, looking down this list, like I think the the other name that people hear us talk a lot about is Gerald Everett. Man, I love Gerald Everett. Um, you've got a talented, athletic profile with a guy that was stuck in a situation early in his career, right? Where you had Tyler Higby there as well. So you had two you had two good tight ends. They had just paid Tyler Higby too. You know, they brought Gerald Everett in. They paid Higby the next year. They did use a lot of 12 personnel. Everett did flash briefly, like when he got the chance. And he just, he, he was also just stayed dinged up. And then last year, you know, we thought, thought okay, finally, maybe he's freed. He's going to be in Seattle. We're going to see this new offense. It's going to look more like the Rams. You know, it, the Seattle, you just have to discount everything with Seattle last year, right? You just basically have to throw it out the window. Um, it was terrible coaching. Russell Wilson was, Russell Wilson was hurt. So for me, Gerald Everett, you know, is a player I know we've talked about. We've talked about the division he's in, um, plays with Justin Herbert, plays in a pass heavy offense. Um, and there's contingent value, right? What if what if Mike Williams goes down? He he gets hurt often. Keenan Allen's an older player that could decline some. You know, Austin Eckler is a 27 year old running. There's a lot of avenues. Not that we don't we don't want any of those players to get hurt. There are a lot of avenues for Gerald Everett um, to, to pick up target share this season over certain and maybe not for the whole season, right? But just in certain games. And then if you're in best ball, like because they're going to be in so many damn shootouts, like they're they're tied for the third most shootouts right now of games over fifty plus points on on uh, Superbook. Of the, so those are games of fifty plus. The Chargers have seven 
and the schedule towards the end of the season is like great and it's also incestuous where it's just it's just afc west on afc west and like i probably shouldn't have explained anything as incestuous but anyway that just came out of my mouth um so <laughs> everett everett's a guy that i really love and a guy that i'm warming to right now i know i know we're we're, we're feeling time with tight end talk i feel like we always do this but it's the bears <laughs> dude i've been warming a little more like the hunter henry you know i'm just like you know like the talent profile is not bad it's a former first round pick. He had a 75.9 PFF receiving grade last year. Eventually he just displaced Johnny Smith. Like it was, he never got to that 80%, you know, that we want, but he was right around 70%. The dude got 50% in 50% of the targets in the end zone for the Patriots went to Hunter Henry. Um, so, uh, and he's been around 30% for his career. So it's, it, which yeah. is also a really good mark. So it's not like, you know, it, this is just his first time for that to ever happen. And then also when we look at ADP, nobody knows what to do with the Patriots, right? There's no, there's not one wide receiver going in the top 36 of ADP. Um, you know, the, the running back situation we've already talked about, right? It's all split up, divvied up. So Hunter Henry's a name that I have warmed up to lately and it's easy to stack with Mac Jones. Um, sorry. I know this is a bearish podcast. Oh, you're good. I think uh, let's let's keep talking some Hunter Henry. What the hell? Uh, with uh, you know, Jacob Johnson going off the roster, their fullback. It would make sense if Johnu um, and they yeah. already used him a little bit in the backfield, but like Johnu and Hunter Henry, almost like I could see them just playing like basically different positions in this kind of version of the offense with Henry being the primary red zone threat. And hey, Mac Jones. He's been, you know, uh, credit to uh, uh, Hayden Winks over Underdog. We were pot uh, potting last week, and he was just like, look. Mac Jones was really freaking good at Alabama. He was really good as a rookie. Like, why are we so afraid of just saying Mac Jones is really good? He keeps uh, keeps doing it. And, hey, if he's going to continue to take a leap forward and we actually see him start putting up some counting numbers, Hunter Henry's going to be one of the top guys soaking up a lot of that. So, Dude, Mac Jones, I moved up uh, my quarterback ranks this week just because, again, like – I, I kind of had the same thought. Like I, I didn't necessarily hear Hayden say that, but Hayden's mm -hmm. a smart dude, so it doesn't surprise me. And I'm just sitting there looking at it. I'm like – Okay, like quarterbacks take a step forward. Yeah, we we think they're going to probably be a run heavy offense, but we don't know for sure. Bill Belichick has ran an offense that passed the ball all the time. The personnel says they're probably going to run the ball. They're so in, they're so infatuated with having all these backs on the roster. So there's a lot of things that point to not a pass heavy offense. But what's the one thing that make an offense turn into a pass a pass heavy offense? The number one thing that has to happen is you have to have a good quarterback, and maybe Mac Jones just is good. Yeah. And the other thing I love about it, Ian, is if you're in the late rounds, let's say, you know, especially over in best ball, because of the uncertainty, like you can get Jacoby Myers in the 13th round, you can get Hunter Henry, you know, in the 14th or 15th round, um, you know, there's worse things to do than taking Kendrick Bourne in round 17 if you have Mac Jones on your roster. So if it like I had a, I, ha I had a roster the other day, like this was two days ago and I was drafting from early position. I was drafting from one hole. And like, I tried to set up my stacks. I couldn't get any of them. Like I, nothing worked out. Like, um, I had, you know, T Higgins burrow went early. I had, um, I don't know. I can't even remember who all I had. I had all the, all these receivers that were all set up. that could all be stacks. None of them worked out. So I was like, screw it. I just want to, I just went ahead and took Jacoby Myers, turn around in the next round, took Mac Jones. Then in the next round, I took Hunter Henry. And I was like, okay, fine. I have a stack now. Jacoby is the single cheapest wide receiver one. Maybe you think it's Devontae Parker. Fine. He's going, you know, basically three wide receiver slots later. But just based on a team's number one projected wide receiver, the Patriots are the absolute stone cold cheapest. And Henry and seems ambiguity to have been, is good to buy in. Yeah. And ambiguity is good to buy into when you get it as a, at a discount, right? Yeah. It's not great when you got to spend a seventh round pick on it, you know, but when you can spend a 12th or a 13th because nobody's for sure to where to put their chip. Yeah, I, I'm I'm warming, you know, to putting chips late on the Patriots, especially if and if you've got Chase Edmonds already on your team, that gives you a week 17 potential shootout if you're playing in best ball mania. There's just a lot of different ways you can work it without having to sacrifice ADP or your draft strategy. And it's easy to make work. So overall, with the Chicago Bears back on topic, uh, Dwayne and I aren't really too far off of consensus on any of the key parties involved. We are fine getting Justin Fields right around that QB 14, 15 range, basically just after the Cousins card tier, if not kind of it mixed in with those guys as well. Dave Montgomery, both of our RB 20s, but just in that dead zone, we're really leaning towards the wide receivers, even the quarterbacks going in that spot. Like don't love Khalil Herbert late just because there is a chance, like there's a chance with Cole Komet and, and Montgomery himself that the roles are going to be different in this new offense and you know 
it could be, it could end up being an awfully expensive pick for a guy that isn't going to be a three down handcuff and probably won't have much standalone value to begin with. So just wouldn't, you know, go out of your way to necessarily get him. Darno Mooney, where he's going as like the wide receiver 30 is perfectly fine because you know what? Even if he is kind of mid, then 140 targets to a mid receiver is still pretty freaking good in fantasy land. Byron Pringle, Belis Jones, you're probably not going to draft in your redraft leagues, nor should you, but best ball to stack with fields in the very last round is more than reasonable. Cole Komet, someone that both Dwayne and I se- seem like we will be underweight on. We are happy to do so because the offensive environment and just – his talent, what he's shown us so far, and I think the heavy potential that no one seems to be considering about his uh, opportunities going down, both in terms of routes and targets alike. Um, yeah, I just, again, there's give me one of these tight ends that I think is every bit, if not more talented and much better offenses at cheaper price points, like Higby as well, like Gerald Everett, Higby. G- give me those guys rounds later than Cole Komet. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think you just did a good job of, you know, outlining all that. Like, here's what I'll say. Like, I'll just give the folks like, so I've done 50 drafts over like the last two weeks, um, full PPR over on DraftKings. So this doesn't include like the stuff I've done on underdog here recently. So this is all best ball. I'll just give you my bears exposures real quick. Um, so I've got Justin Fields, uh, at 13%. Um, and so like my top quarterbacks are Derek Carr at 31%, Kyler Murray at 33%, Russell Wilson at 31%. But my next tier are guys that are around 13%. And so Justin Fields is one of them, you know, so that also is, I just had to say all that to make Ian happy. So he knows that I take Mm -hmm. Justin Fields. Um, and then Khalil Herbert, I've got at 16%. That was higher. I've kind of started tapering off on him over the last week after reading about Tristan Ebner, who's somebody will definitely be watching in camp listening to hear, you know, maybe if he's going to have more of a role and if he isn't, you know, we may be back more on to Khalil Herbert, you know, we'll have to see what happens with that, but still 15%, you know, is pretty high. Like my, my highest backs, like even in that range, Isaiah Spiller, I've got 38%. I've got Jamal Williams, who I think people are way underrating at 36% for where you get him. Rashad White, 38%. So a tier tier or two below those guys, but I'm fine getting Khalil Herbert. Uh, I don't have Cole Komet at all. So, I mean, I think that tells you on that. Even though he's young, I don't really care, and it is an ADP thing. The ADP, I don't think, is right on Cole Komet. And then whenever we look at the receivers, um, I don't have any shares of Darnell Mooney uh, over in this format. I know I have one or two over on underdog. I've got Byron Pringle four times, so 9%. And it's usually like with around 18, 19, 20 pick. Um, and, and it's usually some sort of correlation thing that would make Ian pissed off if I told you why I actually did it. So, <laughs> um, that's it. Yeah. So I, I don't have a ton of bears, but like, if I'm gonna, if the ones I'm, I'm playing around with the most are obviously Justin Fields. Khalil Herbert, and then way late, you know, Byron Pringle, where it makes sense. Dwayne, you got your quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end tiers out on pff.com this week. Great day to be great there. Hats off to you. I'm not wearing a hat, but if I did, I'd take it off to you for continuing to grind through the early dog days. Well, of what do you summer. got coming this week, Ian? You know, you got the team previews. I just else? finished. I just finished my 32nd and final team preview before How this podcast, and then I went for a run. So I'm kind of exhausted, Dwayne. So I hope my energy level was okay uh, for this podcast. But feels good to be done. And uh, you know, again, just it, it was important, I think, for uh, all of us to get a good standing on just the the rosters, the players, because. Uh, Again, we can we can say good things about every single player in the league, and you know I think we did for a, a happy majority of these guys. Let's let's keep positive vibes, you know, all about it. But as we all know, strategy is going to ultimately be the biggest, I think, piece of ultimately winning that championship. You can't just take the best player you think is the best in every single round and expect for everything to work out. And now we have a solid two and a half months to continue to wrap our minds around that. Not even not even that long. We got about month and a half or something i can't really count dates right now Dwayne. but i'm excited to go through it excited to get more done uh with you my friend so we'll have a lot more guest episodes uh, we're gonna do some live we're, redrafts go ahead yeah we're gonna do some uh we're gonna do some like mid stake type redraft yeah. stuff you know like over ffpc do some football guys players championships um so starting starting to you know we love we love best ball we'll continue covering best ball too but i am excited about getting into some redraft stuff great day to be great as always for Dwayne I'm Ian thanks so much for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast and until next time take care everybody <laughs>